Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, life is filled with choices. Would you agree with that statement? Oh no, you have to another choice to face, right? And it's probably not the first choice that you've made this morning. You've made lots of decisions already. You made the decision of whether to be here or to be somewhere else. You made the choice of what to wear, the choice already of where to sit in church, the decision of right now whether or not to listen. There are lots of choices that we face in life, and some of those choices and decisions that we make are rather insignificant. The decision that many of you will make this afternoon of whether to have a hamburger or a hot dog is probably not a decision that is drastically going to affect the rest of your life. But there are other choices that are rather monumental, that are rather life-changing in nature. Should I ask her to marry me? Should we buy that house or not? Should I believe that or should I dismiss that? Should I schedule that surgery now or should I wait until later? When you face decisions in life, where do you turn? Do you just go with your gut feeling? Do you go to a spouse, maybe to a close friend, maybe to your parents for some sage advice? Where do you turn? Do you try to find somebody who might be an expert in that specific area? Somebody who has a lot of experience, somebody who has accumulated a lot of knowledge over time, somebody that will hopefully guide you into making the right decision? Wherever you turn, you want to find somebody who knows you, somebody who cares about you, somebody who will be truthful with you, somebody that you can trust, somebody that is dependable. And when you find that person, then you have found something that is truly valuable to help you to face all of those decisions throughout life. There was a group of people who lived in a little city called Berea who were facing some pretty important decisions. You see, this group of people, somebody had shown up at their church and had claimed to have a message from God. And so now these Bereans, they were faced with the decision of should they believe what this guy was saying or not? Was what he telling them, was it the truth or was he trying to mislead them? These people, they didn't turn to their guts. They didn't turn to one another to try to figure out what to do. Instead, they turned to someone more reliable, something that they knew would help them to evaluate what this person was saying. They turned to the Bible. Like a jury that was carefully examining all of the evidence to see if that evidence supported the accusations. So these Berean believers were turning repeatedly to the pages of Scripture, to examine what God taught to them, to see if it supported what this man, the Apostle Paul, was delivering to them. The message was this. Was Jesus the Messiah? Was Jesus the Savior that all of those Old Testament prophecies had promised? The one who was to come into the world and to rescue the world from the guilt of sin. The Bereans were not so quick to accept. They were quick to listen, but not so quick to believe. Because before they believed, they wanted to search the pages of the Bible. To make sure that what Paul said was right in line with the pages of Scripture. And so when they found that the evidence was conclusive, that what Paul said was right in line with what the Bible said, then and only then were they willing to believe what Paul said and to accept it as true. You and I are just like those Bereans, aren't we? We look to the same place. We look to the Bible. We look to the Bible to guide us and to direct us when we face the various situations and 
different circumstances of our life to determine what we will believe and what we will dismiss, what we will do and what we will avoid. And the reason that we turn to the Bible is because we believe it to be the divinely inspired Word of our God. The way in which God has chosen to speak to us today. We turn to the Bible because we believe that in those pages of Scripture we find divine truth. That we find the truth to be able to evaluate every message and every messenger that comes to us. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people in our world that are still searching for truth. That have very quickly dismissed the Bible as any source of truth. And if you listen carefully, you'll find people that are just echoing the same thing that has been heard Well, ever since the days of that Roman governor of the first century who looked at Jesus and shrugged his shoulders and said, "Eh, what is truth? There are a lot of people that believe that truth is relative. That good and evil, right and wrong, is something that you determine on your own or that a group of people votes on and determines what is right for them. You hear those mantras of relativism in Sayings like this. Who am I to judge? Who are you to tell me what is right and wrong? To each his own. But dear friends, don't be sucked into that hoax. Because not only is it illogical, is it extremely dangerous. Can you imagine applying that line of thought to things such as the Holocaust? To child abduction? To racism? Can you imagine what the outcry would be if you looked at those sort of things and and just shrugged your shoulders and said, hey, who am I to judge? To each his own. There is absolutely right and wrong. You can't help but look at those atrocities and say there is absolutely good and there is evil. But the real question is, who is the one that gets to determine? Who is the one that gets to decide what is good and what is evil? Who is the one that gets to determine what is right and wrong? Are we going to look to each other? Are we going to look to frail and failing human beings to determine what is right and what is wrong? Is that really a good idea? I mean, honestly, how often have our gut feelings been wrong? How often has there been sadness and suffering and oppression brought by people who claim to be doing what is what they feel good? Is it really a good idea to to look to people with all of our limitations, with all of our past failures, and, and to somehow think that in some way we're going to be able to develop the truth, that if we could just put it to a vote, that we'll be able to determine what is right and wrong? Is that really a good idea? Considering what human history has shown to us. Don't you think it would be better to turn to someone outside of ourselves? Somebody who is not limited by the things that you and I are limited by? To turn to something more reliable than just a gut feeling or to intellect? Somebody who really knows you. Somebody who who is not afraid to tell you the truth and be honest with you. And isn't that what we find when we open up the Bible? A God who does not diminish or hide the hideousness of sin and its all-encompassing effects on the human race. But a God who is honest with us. A God who declares, there is no one who does good, not even one. The Bible proclaims that there is one source of hope, and it has nothing to do with you and me, but rather a source of hope that is divine. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The Bible shows us a God who gives salvation 
not dependent upon what a person has done, but God declares, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave his son for people who are, by nature, perishing in sin. The very Son of God, Jesus Himself, came into this world to live in perfect conformity to His heavenly Father's will for you and for me who have too often conformed our ways to the ways of the sinful world. Jesus, the very Son of God, enters this world and He goes to the cross and there He gives His life, taking upon Himself the punishment of every one of our sins, for every one of those times that we have failed to look to or to trust God's word and have instead looked to ourselves, thinking that we foolishly had a better way than that all-knowing, all-loving God. For every sin and for every sinner, God was willing to sacrifice his son's life so that through his life, death, and resurrection, we would have a sure and certain hope of salvation given to all those who trust in Jesus as their Savior. That is the truth that brings freedom. That Jesus referred to when he said, the truth will set you free. That is a freedom that comes from knowing that God has done everything necessary for your salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is a freedom that comes from knowing that, that our salvation and our right relationship with God does not depend upon what we have done or what we have not done or what we promise to do in the future. But it's a freedom that comes from knowing that everything has been done already for us to be right with God and with Him in heaven. That is a freedom that comes from knowing that when we look to the pages of Scripture, that we see a God who knows us perfectly, who has loved us perfectly, who is perfectly dependable, a God that we can trust to guide our lives. That is the truth that sets us free. That is why the Bereans, that's why you and I, that's why we look to the pages of Scripture because we know there that we have found divine truth. Truth that helps us to evaluate every message and every messenger that comes to us. Now I'm pretty sure that there were a few people in the Berean Christian congregation who probably looked at what their fellow Bereans were doing and probably rolled their eyes every once in a while. I mean, did you listen to what the Bereans did? Listen again. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Don't you think there are probably a couple of Bereans who, who just rolled their eyes and thought to themselves, really, do we have to be so critical of every single thing that Paul says? I mean, really, every single day we need to go back to the Scriptures and to evaluate what Paul says. Do we really need to do this? And the answer was pretty simple. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason was not because Paul was kind of a shady character. Not so sure if we should trust him or not. It didn't have anything to do with Paul. Instead, it had everything to do with God. And the warning that God had given to his Old Testament people and that Jesus had repeated. Warnings like this. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The Bereans were watching out for the wolves. They didn't want to be misled. They didn't want to be deceived into doing or believing something that was contrary to, to God's will and, and God's word. The Bereans did not want to rely upon something that they thought they might have heard from the Bible 30 or 40 years ago. No, they, they wanted to, to search the scriptures daily to learn and to relearn those truths of God's word so that they were ready to evaluate every message that came to them so that they knew what to believe and they knew what not to believe. 
And in that way, they were well prepared. In that way, the Bereans are really good examples for Christians of every age, aren't they? And the reason that I say that is this. You've probably heard the saying that ignorance is bliss. I disagree. I think ignorance is probably one of the devil's greatest tools. How easy is it to mislead a person who doesn't even know that they're being misled? And there are plenty of false teachers out there, false prophets. People who claim to be religious, people who claim to be loving, people who claim to be wise. How will you decide which message and messengers to believe and which ones to dismiss? Whenever a Christian does not regularly hear that word of God, who is not well grounded in those truths of Scripture, they're not ready. They're not ready to know what to believe and what not to believe, what to do and not to do. They're putting themselves in a very vulnerable position of being misled and being deceived. They're not prepared to make those choices and those very important decisions in life. And they can quickly become sitting ducks, sitting there in the crosshairs of the devil, misled and deceived, sadly, without even knowing it. That is why it is so important for you and for me to be well grounded in those truths of God's word. To not be satisfied with a knowledge of the Bible that stopped at 8th grade or a knowledge of the Bible that is only contained or only limited by hearing a couple of scripture lessons on a Sunday morning. That's why it's important for us to take those opportunities to study God's word, to relearn and, and to learn again and again and again those truths of God's word. So that when you face those decisions in life, you know what you believe and you know why you believe it. That's why it's so important for us as parents and for grandparents to make sure that their children and their grandchildren know those truths of God's word because they are going to face choices in life. And some of those choices are going to be life-changing choices. We want to make sure that they're well-equipped to be able to go to that truth of God's word and to go there and to be guided by their Savior God. Yeah, life is filled with choices. And while the Lord may not tell us what to have for lunch or where to sit in church, we know exactly where to go to find that divine guidance for every decision of life that we find in the Bible divine truth. Truth that sets us free. Free to enjoy the salvation that Christ has secured for us. Free to know that the Lord who guides us in his word is a God who knows you, who loves you, who is honest with you, who is faithful and dependable. May the Lord lead us through his word. Amen.